you guys are here. It's so fun to have uh, Katrina and Tim up here uh, bringing some uh, awesome luck songs. We're starting a love series today, a two week series on love. So excited to bring them up here and to have them do that. Hey, if you're a guest to Kingsway today, if it's your first time, we have these little cards in our bulletin. They're a way for you to get connected. We have our connections booth. That's actually in our lobby. I'd love for you to fill it out and just take it over there and drop it off at some point during the service so we can get you connected and rolling here with us in this community. Hey, so good to see you guys today. If you would stand though and welcome those around you and say good morning as we start our service. Alright, as we begin our service, you take a seat and just want to pray and welcome God into this place as we begin to sing, as we really just begin to welcome Him and just invite Him into this time as we, as we open up our hearts, open up our minds, allow Him to do His, his thing, the way that He knows He needs to do in our lives and in my life. So let's just pray. Dear Lord. Thank you so much for all that you have done. Thank you so much for what you are going to do, Lord. We are a people that trust your future faithfulness. We see your past faithfulness. We are excited for the future. Lord, we give you our whole lives. We give you everything. It's your name that we pray. Amen. Hey, we go ahead and stand up as we start our worship this morning. Technical difficulties going on this morning where you 
kind of show up and things just don't work like they want to or like they're supposed to. And um, as we kind of come into these two weeks, this, this sermon series on, on love, as we sing a song about and nothing can separate us from God's love, I just, I just want to remind you of, of, of this, what Paul says here in Romans 8. As, uh, as, as I just am so aware that things don't go like planned oftentimes, and I love that God meets us right there. Um, I love that God, um, the, the, the calling on our life, the, the full life that God calls us to live in, um, it doesn't change when things don't go as planned. God's love that for us doesn't change when things don't go as planned, when things don't work out right. And, uh, it just says there in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And when all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I just encourage you, as we continue just to sing some songs, I want to make sure you do whatever you need to do to make sure you're in the right place. Because we don't just... I mean, I know the events I've kind of come from this last week, but we don't just casually come in here. Because we step as a church into the presence of God. When we, we stand here before Him, we sing to Him. That's what, that's what this stuff is all about. And He is the Creator God. Holy God. Make sure to take some time. We we'll get to the middle of a song. To continue to set your mind right. To say, God, would you come in? Would you speak and allow me to listen? Lord, give us, give us a holy perspective of you this morning. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Sing that again. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Sing it out. Oh, I 
about some of this church thing whether I've been raised in the church but Lord here I am Lord would you speak would you speak speak what is true and allow me to hear as I lay my heart before you my life before you knowing that you already know everything that goes on would you just speak Discern my, my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. 
Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hit me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too often for me to attain. Where can I go from your, your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I, if I make my bed in the depths, you, you're there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me. Me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is a light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be.
tip chimp by the grace in his eyes. Grace is an ocean we're all seeking. So heaven meets earth like sloppy wet kiss in my heart. Turns a high leaf inside my chest. Don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about.
sing and I can't control how I want more of you, God. How I want more of you, God. We can sing it. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. something, but maybe let us experience you. Lord, let us truly come face to face with you. And as you meet us right here in this place, not only with your presence, but your love. Lord, with everything that we have done from the beginning of our time on earth, you know it. You knew it. Lord, you meet us in that love. Show us what that Lord, let that love ignite something in us that we don't know, that we've not experienced before. Lord, we praise you and give you all the glory to your name. Let me sing my prayer. Amen. You guys can take a seat. So good to see you guys. Man, what an amazing time. I know you guys didn't get to see some of the franticness that was going on at 830 this morning, but let's just say that uh, God was in this place already because some of the things that needed to come together for you guys to be able to do this and have the songs, to be able to sing that and have a sound system that's working right now is incredible. So I just, uh, first of all, just give God praise for that because it's stinking awesome. You guys didn't get to see it, but there was a lot of craziness going on about 830 this morning. Hey, we got a series that we're going to jump into in just a minute. Before I do, it's a two-week series on love. And I got to tell you, this is, this is a series that's coming from a personal place for me. Uh, it's a series I bumped into. Uh, I know I've confessed before up here that I'm kind of a, a sermonaholic. I listen to a lot of sermons. And, you know, I, I sometimes like to exaggerate some things, but I'm not kidding you. If I'm not listening to five or six, seven, eight sermons a week, probably I'm like dead. Because I don't know why now I just listen to a ton. I think it's because at some point in my life, like about four years ago, God decided that I was going to begin to preach, and I wasn't ready. <laughs> and a lot of you were here, and you saw those first couple weeks, and even last week, and you know that you know I'm still learning. 
And so I just, I just trying to glean from God's word. I try to glean from the people that he has talented and given positions to do this. And so I bumped into a sermon series about, oh, three, four, five months ago uh, on love. And it's by this guy named Judah Smith. And I, I encourage you to go and look up some of his stuff. He is a hipster to the nines. He's from Seattle, Washington. And uh, he has just got some incredible stuff. He's a seventh generational preacher. All right. So he says that means he has way more baggage than anyone else in this room. So he can, he can win every single time. That's all that means. So he just, he's a great guy, and his sermon series about four or five months ago just touched my heart. And the things that I get to share with you over the next two weeks, some of the things that he just pulled out of some scripture, and there's some things that I've gotten to add to it, some things that I've gotten to excited to share with you as well. But man, you guys, the scripture that we're going to look at and the things that God is going to show and reveal about his love for us, it is going to be restful. It is going to be encouraging to you. It is something that I hope you walk out of this place this week and next week just going, oh, I needed that. I, I needed to be reminded of that. I needed to learn that. I needed to know that. I needed to be shown that. And I hope and pray that that's exactly what God does. So let me read for you uh, John chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, which we're going to study today. And then I'm going to pray uh, that God would do what only he can do, and that is open our minds and hearts to be transformed by his love. So let's read this together. Or let, let me read it to you, but you can watch on the screen if you'd like. Uh, verse 11, or verse 1, chapter 11 says this. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her, his sister, or her sister Martha. Uh, Mary, was, whose brother was Lazarus, now lay sick and was the same one who had poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair, which is a story from earlier on. And so the sisters sent out word to Jesus, and they said, Lord, the one you love is sick. The one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And verse 5 says, Jesus loved Mary, or Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. Let me pray for you, and then we'll jump into our lesson today. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, I'm not just praying for them, I'm praying for me. And Lord, as we read this scripture, and we encounter your word, and Lord, we sing songs of praise and we gather in a place and for many of us confessing and uh, realizing our, our depth of our faults and our struggles. Lord, we know that your word, the life that you hold up, the love that you have for us, it is truly a full and sustaining life. And Lord, as we enter into this time, would you just guide our minds, guide our hearts, Lord, reveal the things that you want to show us. As your name we pray. Amen. I don't know if many of you have satellite TV, but I stumbled upon a, a story just a, a few days ago from a, a, a company's uh, <laughs> archives of a conversation that a, a customer service agent had with a customer who was less than satisfied with their service. Anybody ever had to call that 1-800 number for your service? That is like one of the favorite things to do, right? Just block off like two hours and you just get ready like with a soda and chips. You know, yeah, I'll hold you know, like, but I can't be watching the TV, otherwise you wouldn't be calling. But, you know, you're sitting there getting ready. You know, it's funny because I, I hear this statement all the time that you say, you don't say what you mean in the moment. You know, when you get in the moment, sometimes you say things you don't mean. And I couldn't agree less with that. I think in the moment, sometimes when you get so stressed, you say exactly what you mean. You know what I'm talking about? You say exactly what you mean. In fact, sometimes you've been so distracted by saying not what you mean that all of a sudden it just comes out. All right? This is one such story. This uh, agent is actually going to be in the, the winning situation here because the person that calls, calls already ticked off, and he says the first thing out of this customer's mouth is, my TV is not working. And, of course, the agent, uh, the customer service agent says, I would be happy to help you. What is, seems to be the problem? So, well, my TV is flickering on and off. I can't get the, the, the station to stay. So that's great. I normally don't work with the TV. I'm normally the internet guy. But because he could tell that this guy was about to blow up, you know what I'm saying, he just said, you know what, but I'll just see if I can help you. All right, so he starts to begin the conversation of trying to troubleshoot what the problems could be. So, of course, they have to start with the really simple ones because, of course, he's reading a list, people. It's not like he's coming out, he's just reading the list. Is it plugged in? Are the wires connected? 
Are you using the right channel input on your TV? He's going down the list, and of course the guy is exasperated because he has tried most of these things already. Like much of you, maybe you've had the situation. But so you're like, yes, yes, yes. You memorize the questions. All right, yes, yes, yes. I tried those things. I tried those things. It doesn't work. So, okay, so, uh, so what exactly is happening? Describe exactly what's happening. Well, I'll be watching a channel, and then all of a sudden it'll just cut out, and then it'll cut back in. So it's okay, so it seems to be a signal loss. Okay, so let's go into your adapter and he goes, okay, so your signal seems to be really weak. Is there anything that you think in your house right now or outside your house that could be causing your signal to be weak? And the guy says, well, it's snowing really hard right now. And at that point, I think, you know, I can't get inside the guy's head, you know what I'm saying? But at that point, he goes, that could be the problem. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, that's what he wants to say. But he can't. So he's like, OK, so it, it is, uh, it's snowing. OK, so how, how much snow is there? Well, we've gotten a foot so far. We're supposed to get another few inches, maybe, maybe another half a foot. And the guy's like, OK. So probably what's happening, he's trying to say this in nice terms. Probably what's happening is your dish is being covered with snow, and so as the dish is warming a little bit from it having electricity and so forth, it, it melts the snow and then more snow sticks to it. So you're kind of seeing this ribbons and the guy's like, oh, okay, cool. So can you check to see if it has snow on there for me? <laughs> Customer service, this is such a good job. You know what I'm saying? It's like, sir, I'm a sorry, I, I wish my technology allowed me to see if there was snow on your satellite dish. I wish that it allowed me to do that, but it doesn't, and so I, I can't, and, and I'm not kidding you. The guy goes, well, how am I supposed to know if it has snow on it or not? <laughs> and at this point, the customer service agent just loses it. And he, just, he just loses it. He says exactly what he wanted to say the whole time, which is, sir, you have to get outside of your house, you have to go in your yard, and you have to look at the satellite dish, and if it has snow on it, your satellite's not going to work. <laughs> now, some of you in here, you're like, awesome. Just wish people would say what they mean when they first, you know, they had that moment. Now, here's the cool thing. Here's the crazy thing. In that story, you're immediately like, yes, yes, I've been there. I've had that moment with my wife. I've had that moment with my friend. I've had that moment in the McDonald's parking lot. I've had that moment on the freeway when that person, or you're like, oh. you know, I've had those moments where I just wanted to. What's crazy is the moment that we just read in John chapter 11 is the exact same thing. See, it, it, Mary and Martha are in the thick of it. I mean, they are, they are in the thick of it, because if you really look at what's going on in this chapter 11, basically Lazarus, their little brother, he is so sick, you guys. They've tried all the other options. They have gone every other direction they possibly could, but the only thing they've decided could be the saving grace for their little brother is a miracle. And so they've decided there's only one person that's doing miracles. There's only one person that could save him. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. See, in that moment, they don't have time for pleasantries. You know, if you were writing a letter for someone you loved, the reasons why you need to save them. Can you imagine this? Imagine the person that you love the most. You got to sit down and write a letter for why they need to live. You know anything about this? Would it be short or long? Would probably be long, right? You would have like, you'd list out probably all the reasons why they should live. They help people. They read their Bible all the time. They have two beautiful kids they need to raise. They have all these little things that they need, need. You need to come and, and, and see there's this moment in there where they're sending word to Jesus. And you know all that they say is, Lord, the one that you love. Dot. The end. Send it off. All of their hope that their brother will be healed is in one sentence. 
It's not, it's not in a huge laundry list of incredible things that Lazarus has done. It's not an incredible reason why campaign. It's just one reason. It's just, Lord, the one that you love. Because see, in the moment when thick came to thin and stuff started rubbing shoulders and things started getting really intense, Mary and Martha believed this thing. God is moved more by his love than our love for him. And some of you guys needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. I mean, let's say that again. And this is just mind-boggling to you. Because if you, I mean, if you really just look at this scripture and you look at it quickly and you just run through it, of course it's, it says, Jesus, come and save the one that loves you. That's, that's what it says, right? I mean, if you just stared at it quickly, I mean, that's what it says. It's like, Jesus, hey, the one that loves you is dying. The one that loves you, you need to come save him. You need to come get him. You need to come here and rescue him. You need to come make him. But that's not what it says. See, Mary and Martha knew at the core of this, the thing that was going to motivate Jesus the most was God's love for Lazarus. Not Lazarus' love for Jesus. Hmm. I want to take that, and I want to blow that up over the next few minutes. And I want to expose to you why this just so matters. Because, you guys, the Bible isn't a book about us. It's just not. The Bible isn't a book about describing how we can be awesome and how God's going to make us more awesome and how we are just this incredibly awesome thing, much to my disappointment, because I'd love that. And it doesn't say that we can't be awesome. And it doesn't say that we won't be more awesome. And it doesn't say that we can't be an experience awesome. It just isn't about us. It's about God. It's always been about God. The whole book's about God. It's about someone we can't see or fathom that is unearthly, beyond our reach, being described in words and stories and incredible tales of faithfulness so that we may know him. And then we may know his love. So what is this love? If it motivates Jesus beyond even our love for him, what, what is this love? How can we know this love? So let's look at a couple things. What could love mean? How could God's love look? And there's two ways that I want to just show you. There's two different words that kind of used to describe love in the New Testament. The first one is this. Phileo, phileo. Some of you may know this word. It, it means earthly love, brotherly love. And it's actually where we get the name Philadelphia. It's the city of what? Brotherly love, brotherly love. It's this idea, this, this term, this word that's used in the New Testament to describe, to be a distinct version of love. And it's a great love. It's actually an earthly love. And it's a love, though, that needs something in return. This is a great love, but it's a love that needs something in return. Let me describe a scene to you and why this is so important. If you were going to a wedding and two people were in love with each other, I mean, you know I'm talking about that puppy love? You know, like everything they do, like one could drool and they'd be like, oh, this is so cute. You know, like, you know, like the other one could fart and the other one would be like, oh, just stop it. Her parts smell like rainbows, you know, like I, you know, like they, they're just so in love. It almost makes you sick, you know, and some of you have been married like four or five years. You're like sick, you know, like you've already forgotten what it felt like, you know, some of you have been married 50 years. You're like, we're still there. No, <laughs> but it's crazy because at a wedding, though, you don't ever see that moment, you know, where the groom's standing up there and he's, he's, you know, I should do this. You know, he's standing up there, and he's nervous as all get it. He's always got sweat stains all the way down his face. He's trying to remember his lines that he didn't pay attention during the rehearsal. And he's trying to remember his vows that he wrote last night that he's supposed to spend all this time on. And, and he's got this face, and then all of a sudden, what happens, right? The bride comes in, and she starts walking down the aisle, right? Can you imagine for a moment 
if the bride just was like, no, I don't want to be here. Oh, I don't want to be. And like getting drugged by her dad all the way down the aisle. You know what I'm talking about? Like all the way down. She's like, no, don't make me do that. Like you guys would be like, oh, that's just so precious. It's so incredible. It's just meant to be, you know? No, you wouldn't do that because that is not love. We know that phileo love is, is something that's reciprocated. It's earthly love. It's something that we say, no, it needs to be reciprocated. It's something that I need to know that the other person loves me back. I need to know that they're taking care of the thing I gave you. If, if I gave a car to someone in here, all right, if I gave a car to someone in here, and then the next week they go on Auto Trader and sell the thing, and I come and ask them, I'm like, hey, I gave you that car. You remember that? Oh, you sold it? You sold that car. I gave you that car. You better love that car. You better take care of that car. You better, you know what I'm talking about? That kind of love, it needs to be reciprocated. Now, here's the crazy thing, right? This is how friendships work, right? It's how friendships work. You know why? You say, I love my best friend till they gossip about me, then I hate them, right? I love my best friend till they hung out with her. Now, no more, right? It needs to be Reciprocate. And it's crazy. And we know this. I mean, it's a description of love. And we're like, no, it's great. Because some of you know you have this incredible connection with your wife or with your husband. And it's a love that there have been times that you have given and you have received back. And you have given and you have received back. And there's a continued relationship. Some of you have friends in here that have lasted your lifetime. They have been through you through thick and thin. They have, they have experienced your worst moments and your best moments. And they have stuck by you. And they continue to love you, and they continue to love you back. And it's just incredible love. But here's the crazy thing. God doesn't phileo you. He doesn't phileo you. That, that's not the word that's used to describe the love of God. So the word that describes the love of God in Scripture is agape. Some of you, 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 you need a thing to help you remember. Is I got it. It's agape, right? No, never mind. It's a horrible jingle. I got it. It's agape. It's agape love. See, it's an unearthly love. It's a heavenly love. It's something that is not found on our planet. And this is a love that does not need to be reciprocated. This is something that does not need the other person to love you back, to be possible. This is a crazy description of love. This is a description of love that's like almost a little creepy, all right? If you can imagine God on high stalking you, whether you love him or not, he is absolutely in love with you. A little creepy, huh? Yeah. Watches you while you sleep, takes care of everything you need before you need it. Yeah, see? Starts getting a little creepy. Like, whoa. Yeah. And here's the thing. Some people never know it. They never receive it. They never even know what's going on. But yet God still agapes them. God still loves them. God still is obsessed with them. So here's the, here's the cool way to do this. You, John, the writer of this gospel, is so obsessed with love. Like he uses love all the time. In his gospel, in his three epistle books, I mean, he just uses it all this thing in time because he knows that God is what? God is love. It's a part of his character. And he has this amazing verse that we all learned if we were in the church growing up, John 3, 16. And, and it's such a cool description of this agape love. This agape love. It's really a cool description. Let's look at this together. It's just what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but what? Have eternal life. Now, here's the cool thing. If we take this and we turn it into an agape style, this is what it sounds like. God is so obsessed. God is so obsessed with bad people, with bad people that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, whenever, wherever would believe in him would have eternal life. Isn't that crazy? 
Because see, when it says God so loved, it really means God was so obsessed. When it says God so loved the world, it's saying the world is actually a word for bad things, terrible things, not good things, the worldly things, bad people. And when it says whoever at the end of it, he died for whoever, it literally means whoever. It's what it means. Whoever. No guarantees, no, no ifs, no buts. It's whoever. Nothing. Oh, I broke my clip. This is going to stink. Hold on a second. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Can I do it? Hold it. All right. So here's the cool thing. I know this. Bring it back. I know it's outrageously distracting, and I'm sorry. Here's the thing. The cool thing is that when you read that passage like that, you start realizing that that's really hard to believe, isn't it? That God would be so obsessed with bad people that he would die without a guarantee. Thank you, Tim. That he would die without a guarantee. I mean, that, that to me is just mind-boggling. Now, here's the crazy thing. When you start thinking about agape love, and you think about phileo love, what is the love that is more powerful out of the two? I mean, it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, you read that passage and you think it's the love chapter. I mean, if you ever go there and you look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, love is this, and love is this, and it's never this, and love is this. You know, it's like you take every really newlywed couple, and you're like, you need to be this to each other. And they're like, I failed already. Like, before I finished it, I failed. You know, like he read weird, and now I'm angry at him. Like, you know, it, that doesn't work. But if you take it and you put God's name with it, And you start realizing that's who God is. God is patient. God is kind. God is always this. He is always this. He is always this. He is never this. He is always this. I mean, it's just incredible how God's love begins to be revealed as a powerful force. So here's the thing I have for you today, and this is the simple thought. It's the simple thing that at the end of this that just breaks my heart, and it's the thing that I hope just messes with you is that God believes that you are worth it because you are the one that he loves. You are the one that God loves. Wherever you're at, brokenness, hurt, wherever you've been, whatever you've done cannot be enough to delay, take away, keep him from his obsession that is you. There's such a beauty in that that, 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 that God loves you in that moment. There's something that rests in me, because if I'm honest, you guys, if I'm honest, how many times have I written to God about my application for rescue? How many times have I tried to fill out my own letter for application for rescue? Some of you in here have had these moments, right? Like, God, I'm just doing so much better, right? I mean, look at me. I mean, shh, I don't do this anymore. I don't do that. Oh, I sometimes do that. But th I don't do that anymore. You know, like, I love these. You know, I do this. And you have all these things that you pile up as your application for love. This application to be able to receive God's love when it was never, ever, ever about your love. It was about his. For you. And he loves you. He loves me. 
there's this awesome story, just a few verses before John 3.16, that just, it's always one of my favorite stories because I find myself in the story. Maybe you'll find yourself too. How many of you grew up in the church? You know, like you were, you would say like you were a church baby, like you grew up around the church. Okay, raise your hand high because some of you are like gator and armor right now. I couldn't see a single. Now, see, all you were raising your hand. You all did this. What, what was that? It was a gator arm. There we go. Good. All right, so when you grow up in the church, you learn the Bible, right? But sometimes you miss Jesus, right? Sometimes you learned the Bible, but you miss Jesus. Well, this is a story about a guy that learned the Bible but was missing Jesus. And I know this is a left turn, but just let me just remind you, the beginning of the story is at chapter 3 of where For God So Loved the World came from. See, John 3.16, the story starts in John chapter 1. And it's this guy named Nicodemus, and he's made all these awesome choices to be in the church, and he's done all these great things. His heritage is secure. He's, the law is so good, and this incredible stuff. And guess what? At the, end of his, at the end of this day, he sees Jesus do these miracles. He sees all this great stuff, the love that God has for these people. And he sneaks out at night because no one in the church wants to admit that we have problems or we have questions sometimes, myself included. And so he sneaks out, and he finds Jesus, and guess what? He asks Jesus, hey, are you the one that everybody is supposed to be looking for? And you know what Jesus says? Yes. <laughs> and the only way, and this is, this is so powerful, you guys, the only way that you're going to receive my love, the only way that you're going to be a follower of me is if you are born again. You're born again. And I love the visual image of that. How many of you guys have uh, been in the labor room or watched a child be born? Anybody raise your hand in here? Anybody seen that? Okay. How many wish you could unsee it? I'm just kidding. No hands went down. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's, it's crazy when a child is born, right? There's like a thousand people in a room. There's all this stuff going on. All the, now there's all these things, beepers and stuff going off, right? And everybody in the room that's a doctor or a nurse is totally calm. And everyone else is freaking out, all right? Husbands included. We either get pale and faint or we just pretend like nothing as crazy is happening and we're just totally in control, which both are totally legitimate options. And the woman, of course, is loving the whole thing. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> but in that moment, this child slips out and there is this moment of like, holy cow, there is a new person in the world. Right here, the, the, this, the, in the world, right now, this, this thing was not, it was in there and now it's out here. And, and holy cow, I'm holding it. Some of you have held a newborn baby. They can't eat for themselves. They can't walk, they can't crawl, they can't do anything. But does that change the way a parent loves them? The moment that that child is born, the parent looks into that child's eyes, especially the mother. There's this moment of oh, love, love, unreciprocated, actually going to cost a lot, a lot, and money, <laughs> and sleep. And there's just this moment of just absolute So when Jesus says these words to Nicodemus, I think he's trying to speak to all of us. Look, you have to surrender to this love. This isn't a love you can control. This isn't a love you, you can figure out completely before you try it. This isn't a love that you're completely probably ever understand. Do you think, parents, that your kids know exactly how much you love you? No, they don't. your kids don't know how much they love you. you they think they know. But let me just tell you, you guys... You are the one God loves. You are the one that God loves. He stares at you, needing nothing back, obsessed with you, even as a broken person. He stares at you like a father to a daughter, like a father to a son, and he is head over heels obsessed in love with you. That's why he came. That's why he gave. 
That's why he died. He can't help himself. He's so in love with you. He has to be there. He had to be there. He had to go to the cross. He loved you too much. He had to die so you would live. Because he loves you. I'll tell you, if that, like Kevin said, if, if encountering that love, if, if feeling that wash over you, that God's love means more to him than your love for him, that God loves you more than you will ever love him in return, and he's okay with that. If realizing that God is obsessed with you as a broken person, and, he, and whenever you choose, whenever, wherever you choose, you can choose to believe in it and let him hold you again. I mean, that, that is a beautiful thing. And when you encounter that, I hope that just starts just messing with you. That's what it did in my life. You guys, when I heard this, it was like, it messed me up. Like I was like, like all my reports and things that I've been keeping my applications, like I just like, Psh, great. It's over. It doesn't matter. It's all about God. So here's my, my thing for you as you leave. Like final conclusion. I love what <laughs> pastors will tell you. 45% of your audience re-engages at the word conclusion, so I will conclude. That's why I use it four times. <laughs> My conclusion is this. If I had to write a love letter so that your life would be saved, all I would need to write is God, the one that you love, needs you. The one that you love is hurting. The one that you love needs you. He needs healing. She needs hope. She needs life. Come, bring your love. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as uh, we just let your love wash over us, as your scripture just reveals this incredibly powerful truth, this incredibly honest thing about your love. Lord, this is not about being reciprocated or feeling like that we are going to give something back, that your love is so obsessed with us. It doesn't need that. It continues. It's sustained. It is ever there, and it is all about us. Lord, as we let that sink in, Lord, you are powerful in the way that you love us. You are so incredibly amazing in the way that you love us. Lord, as we encounter that, it change our lives. It wipe away our need to feel secure in what we do. We need to feel secure in how we've earned something. I mean, we just rest in your love. We just rest in that hope. Lord, you've taken care of it. We just need to believe it. Well, it's your name that we pray. Amen. As we go into our response time, there's no better way to give God thanks for his love than to take this little piece of bread and this little cup of juice and reminding us of what his love physically cost him, what it emotionally cost him, the separation, the anxieties, the heartaches of being human, fully human, yet fully God, and yet laying his life down for us. What kind of love is that? Thanking him once again for that and surrendering, saying, I believe. Do what only you can do. If you need to speak, if you, if you, man, if you need prayer, if you need to talk, or maybe you're like, man, this is just totally new to me. This is not what I've been shown before. I, I knew the Bible, but I just never, never met this Jesus. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to pray that, that love over you and let you encounter this person that is Jesus, this love that he has for you. I'll have a couple elders in the front and leaders in the back. We'd love to pray with you if you need it. Let's respond to God's love. Let's respond to his hope, and let's take communion and pray together.
excited to see um, what you continue to do, what you continue to speak. And so just allow us to continue to listen. Um, Lord, as we go out from here, and um, I, I know I, I don't, can't fathom your entire love for me. Uh, but I, I pray you would just continue to show us some aspect of that. As we are your children, and we come before you, our Father, and you say, I love you, I care about you more than you'll ever know. Lord, as we, we do this church thing, show us what it means to truly just be followers of you, to follow where you lead. Lord, to let that love that, that is flowing into us, whether we're aware of it or not, just flow out to others. Continue to show us what it means to worship you and glorify you and love you with everything that we do. Lord, as we take up this, this, this offering, continue to teach us what it means to be a manager. Because we are not owners, we are managers of what is already yours, Lord. So we trust you and we give these gifts for you and for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, we're going to be coming around with offering plates. And just remind you, you're also welcome to give online. You can do so at our website uh, or in the YouVersion notes if you're following along. And we have a couple of announcements for you. As we, before we kind of get ready to go here, and want to want to let you know or just remind you, ladies, um, the women's study at, at Name Catron is teaching started last Monday, and you are invited to that still. That's um, said it while it all goes together. It's not necessarily you can't you can show up anytime and you'll get just as much out of it. So um, we're kind of doing a study through just being intentional. Uh, and what that looks like. And so uh, that is at Nan's house. If you would like more information or directions to her house, you can go out to the Connections booth right in our lobby, and there are um, maps right there for you. We uh, also have our Foundations class that's coming up on March 1st. I want to just uh, throw out an incredible invitation uh, for some of you. I know we're hopefully going to be able to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and personally invite you. But uh, we have our, our Foundations class is basically like a person that's new to Christ or new to Kingsway. We want you to come and, and have an opportunity to really have more of a discussion uh, that's one of our core beliefs, what we choose to believe, and uh, kind of have an open hand, closed hand method. You know, we have some things that we say, this is absolute truth, and there's some of the things we say, hey, let's, let's have a discussion about that. And we love that about Kingsley. We have many different denominations and upbringings and some things that we have discussed and seen, and there's beauty in that. There's some incredible beauty of the body of Christ in that way, and we love discussing that in that class. Love to have you come out and try that. It's March 1st at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We do have child care provided, and we just need you to uh, kind of communicate that you'd like to be a part of that. And how you do that is just come and talk to me. Uh, normally, it's a real small class. It's something normally we have, uh, you know, three, four, five couples that come at a time. And we really enjoy just being able to do that. A couple of the elders also join in in that discussion. It's an opportunity to see some of the leadership and a chance to talk and to see them teach and to, to kind of glean from them as well. So hopefully, we'll take advantage of that March 1st our foundations class. We also have some youth announcements that are coming up, and I just want to very quickly just kind of say this. Our Super Start is coming up the 20th and 21st for fourth and fifth graders. Uh, they have spots reserved. Uh, John has his um, his flyers that are actually on the Connections booth for that. If you have a fourth or fifth grader and they're not attending this, I, at this point, I would just encourage you to, to look at the information, check it out. This is one of those 24-hour trips that can have eternal really ripples in a kid's life, just to, in a cool way of uh, just uh, getting the chance to kids to be around other fourth and fifth graders from around the country, getting a chance to make some new relationships here at the church. Uh, just a great opportunity. So if you have any questions, go talk to John and you can pick up a flyer on the Connections booth. Our high school retreat, which is legend, is coming up here in uh, the 27th through the March 1st. That is uh, filling up quickly. We only have two or three spots left uh, for that trip. And so if you're interested, if you're like, I am not signed up yet, I want to go, uh, the connection or the class booth back there at the back has those flyers on it. So back to the back of the class booth, just pick one of those up, come talk to me. Uh, we also have scholarships available, so that money should never be uh, the thing that keeps your student or, or you from attending. So. All right, any questions about that, do that. Our Wednesday nights are normal. Um, everything is as regular right now on Wednesday nights. And our meal for today is tortellini carbonara. That's how I say it. Olive Garden salad, <laughs> breadstick, and dessert. Hey, you got breadstick. It's not sticks, it's breadstick. Hey, uh, you guys have a great, glorious day in the Lord. If you're new to Kingsway, $4 uh, a person or $12 for max. Or if you're brand new, you're a guest. We'd love to offer you a free gift. So we'll see you guys later. Have a good day. <coughs>